Do you want to tell us a little bit about this particular room and some works in this room? Um, and you'll lead us through and we'll meet some friends. Sure, yeah. sure indeed. So most of the house is hung with uh, female abstract expressionists. So every picture on the wall that you'll see today is by a female artist. Right. Um, and they're either abstract portraits or they're pure abstraction. So the abstract expressionist period uh, runs from basically the sort of mid 1940s when it's in its development um, through to really the early 1960s. Mm -hmm. So um, the movement is launched in 1951 by Leo Castelli's first show in America, the Ninth Street Show. So we can talk a bit more about that as, as we walk around. So the artists that normally spring to mind uh, when we talk about abstract expressionism are Franz Klein, uh, Willem de Kooning, Jackson Pollock, yeah. Mark Rothko. Um, but of course, there was a huge movement in the women artists at the same time painting alongside them. Some of them were intermarried. Lee Krasner was married to Jackson Pollock, for example, Willem and Elaine de Kooning. Dorothy Denner, the sculptor, was married to David Smith. Um, and uh, Pat Pasloff was married to Milton Resnick. Uh, Helen Frankenthaler was married to Robert Motherwell, etc., etc. But they um, were women artists in their own right. It wasn't just that they were in some way emulating their husbands. I mean, it was really a, a, a movement of... Absolutely. In fact, yeah. the only reason that a lot of them ended up marrying the, their male sort of uh, colleagues um, was because um, they were showing at the same galleries, yeah. um, being looked at by the same art critics, um, they were uh, going to the same bars and socialising. So naturally, a lot of them ended mm. up dating and therefore, you know, getting married. Yeah. So it had absolutely nothing to do with one following the other. They were just in the same social scene and the same art scene. So, yeah. so um, that just would happen in, in any kind of business for right. that matter. So, right. uh, so yeah. Right. Chris, um, let's look at some, some works and I'll ask Francesco, our film person, if he can try and, and uh, give, the, give our guests a view of what we're seeing. But do you want to start here? Sure. So um, mostly the movement was in New York, almost entirely, although there was an abstract expressionist movement in the 50s as well um, that was based on the West Coast, largely in the Bay Area. So in my office here in the house, um, I have the artists associated with the West Coast. Uh, this is by an artist called uh, Emiko Nakano. It's uh, 1957, um, who was a significant artist uh, on the West Coast during the 1950s. Um, subsequently, though, she sort of changes sort of her life path in the 1960s, I think, gets married, has children, and sort of leaves the, the art world behind a little bit. But this is 50s, the dilemma, this, the dilemma well, you often see. No? This was often the reason also why... why um, some of the female artists sort of ended up, you know, changing direction in life in general. Right. Um, and she was a Japanese American. She was Japanese American, okay. Emiko Nakano. Okay. Um, above this picture, we have um, two uh, pictures painted right at sort of the perfect moment in abstract expressionism, 1951, the year of the Ninth Street Show. The painting on the left is by uh, Lily Fenichel, um, and the painting on the right is by an incredibly important artist of that period, Deborah Remington, um, and it's a 1951 picture by her. There was so we're here, right? We're exactly. Here. Okay. The, the, the picture on the top right, this is called Eleusian. Um, there was a show at the Denver Museum of Art in 2016 of female abstract expressionists, um, which is really kind of... Uh, one of the, the shows in recent years, probably the key show in recent years, that has kind of kick-started the interest again in, um, in the female abstract expressionists. And since then, there's been a sort of momentum building in, um, in sort of researching these artists again and showing these artists again, which is now just sort of exploding. Actually. Okay, so let's, let's just fix that data, that data right? So yeah. 19, so 2016. Yeah. Denver show. Yeah. It was a seminal show. For, that's right. For, okay. Yeah. That's okay. right. For the movement as a whole. Right. Um, having said that, since the 1950s, there's been dozens and dozens of museum shows surrounding these artists. Yeah. In fact, um, Elaine de Kooning we'll see um, in a second. 
um, had a, a major retrospective that went to five US museums in the early 90s, um, and then had a major retrospective of a portrait at so the National Portrait Gallery in Washington in 2015, mm. and yet still doesn't really have any major gallery representation, which is absolutely extraordinary. It begs uh, you know, the was, question as to why, though, Chris, which, we, which you're going to answer, well, well, right, well, as we well, walk around. Absolutely. These two paintings are both by Sonia Geshtoff. Uh, they're around 1958, 1959. Uh, the one on the left is called The Map, and that's an important picture because it's one of the pictures that represented America in the first Paris Biennale in 1959. So she had two pictures representing America. Um, it has a MoMA sticker on the back because uh, the curators from MoMA chose the pictures to represent America. And um, so uh, this is one of them. Um, it and, seems and this representation in the Biennale for, for women, because it, it was around that time, starting from the 40s, that America started to sort of conquer the Biennale, you know? Uh, well, on yes, some level. that's yeah. right. And um, I mean, what's interesting is it was perfectly normal for a female artist to represent America. We have a, a painting, again, actually by Elaine de Kooning in the hallway that was shown in Japan in one of the sort of CIA backed uh, art tours of American art that was sort of touring the world, right. um, which was trying to sort of promote America after the war using a, uh, a sort of artistic medium of, of, of exhibitions yeah. and um, and of course many of the major artists of the period were women many of the major collectors of the period were women and actually many of the major gallerists of the period were, were women um, Peggy Guggenheim had a gallery in New York until 1947 we we'll talk later about Betty Parsons one of the biggest galleries yeah. uh, of the, sort of the 40s 50s 60s we um, call them influencers indeed right, yeah, they, they were <laughs> actually very very key to kick-starting the, the movement, um, I mean, absolutely imperative. Uh, so, uh, so certainly, yeah. when I mean, I think that's always been the case historically of women patrons on some level wanting to um, promote women artists. You know, starting from the 1600s, really. You know? Yeah, so it's absolutely. Not, it's nothing. It's nothing new, but I think important to mention because um, you know, as women enter into the art scene, they they not only enter as artists, but they enter as supporters, as patrons, as commissioners, uh, as gallery owners, etc., collectors. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And this is the the twin, right? Yes. So this is also by Sonia Geshtoff. This one's called the Queen. Um, below it are two sculpt sculptures by um, Claire Falkenstein, a major sculptor on the West Coast in the. Uh, during this period. Uh, the piece on the left is early 1940s. So are we looking, just so that Francesco also knows which one we're looking at, we're we looking at these fun... That's right, okay. yeah. And this is fairly typical of her work, where yeah. she would take sort of uh, pieces of copper or steel and, and then weld them together in these kind of sort of interesting sculptural meshes. Um, Chris, can you repeat the date for us? Uh, well, this one's sort of mid-1940s on the left. Okay. This, um, this one back here is 1940s. Okay. And then the piece on the right here is around 1960. Okay. Actually, this is a sort of long chain made up of uh, blue, um, aluminium, white, and yellow links. Um, and then you sort of pile it up how you want to sort of show it yourself. Um, I'm clearly not very good at piling it up and showing it because when I... <laughs> First saw it, it looked amazing, and now I've got it piled in, in a bit of a heap. So, but, but it's, I mean, what a responsibility, right? You have to pile it up yourself. Well, I, I was it's... fiddling about with this for about 30, 30, 40 minutes, and uh, I just was sort of going nowhere with it. It's something I've got to spend like a couple of hours trying to get it Yeah, right. I'm sure. Or get somebody else to, to do it who actually knows how to produce a piece of art might be a, might be a better idea. But, but I think it's interesting to, to sort of compare the years, because you're looking at a generation of difference. Yeah, this is quite and, poppy when you look at the colors yeah. and the sort of the you know the idea and the composition there's a renewal you know we're feeling more optimistic Indeed. with this piece besides your pile right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> why don't you lead us through i know that there's a picture over here so this is the 1966 work by bernie spings just sticking with her actually her nickname was bingo she was known as on the west coast even though this is 
you know, quite figurative. You see the swimmer in the water and you yeah. see a kind of skyline, a landscape. And then you've got the water kind of bursting up against this sort of rock almost from underneath the sea. Clearly, I guess, you know, you, you do see that intense colour there of Diebenkorn Tebow in this being uh, painting. So actually, now we think about it, it, it looks very much like a West Coast painting right. when you think of, uh, think of those two artists as well. And that is quite different to New York. So. Well, I think there's a lot of, I mean, in this painting, a lot, a lot is happening because you have such a calm sort of surface. And then in the, in the front of the painting, it's almost like this, you know, whirlwind of energy. Yeah. Uh, it, that doesn't match the water up above. There's a little bit of foreboding, yeah. you know, there. But well, the yellow makes us feel better, doesn't it? Well, very California, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I, I really am interested in what's going to happen in the next room. Okay. Um, and why don't we just let the camera have a look? Um, and you can take your time, Francesco, in showing this particular um, monumental piece. And I know, Chris, there's a lot to say about this painting. So we're all ears um, in terms of, of what we're looking at here. Sure. And, uh, so one of the major painters of um, abstract expressionism was Elaine de Kooning, uh, who married Willem de Kooning in, in 1943. So as well as painting um, pure abstract expressionist paintings, pure abstraction, she also uh, was interested in abstract portraiture. Yeah. Um, she starts painting abstract portraits in the mid-1940s and continues them throughout her career. If you don't see the head or, or even the feet in the, in the um, you know, within a largest, largest sort of square, you can really see how abstract the, the picture is. Definitely. And, and that's um, a little game that they played, no? Uh, and, and she particularly, because she's using figurative. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, certainly, you, you see her exploring abstractionism here, for example. Completely. Um, I mean, in this area here, you've got someone sitting down. You've got knees, legs, trousers, hands. Yeah. Um, and yet, if all you saw was that piece in a picture, you would have no idea, you know, the, yeah. that it was two people sitting down, but you couldn't see their heads. Yes. It's pure abstraction. Yes, exactly. And yet there's a bottom half of two whole figures in that, uh, in that you know, one area. So what is Elaine de Kooning doing here socially? Because these are, this is a group, and the title of the painting, you want to tell it's us a little bit about the yeah. title? So, and who she's representing. It's possibly her most famous picture, actually, other than the JFK series that she does that we'll talk about in a moment. The other interesting thing about it is that there's all sorts of Dutch connotations to it because uh, it's called the Burgers of Amsterdam Avenue. Amsterdam Avenue runs up into Harlem. She's Elaine de Kooning. Yeah. Willem de Kooning is Dutch. Right. And she wants to set it out like a sort of, uh, like a Dutch sort of portrait, multi-figure portrait, like yeah. a night watch, or, uh, or like a sort of du early sort of Dutch or Flemish family scene, you know, Rembrandt-esque. And um, so she's married a Dutchman, Amsterdam Avenue, yeah. runs into Harlem, it's the, you know, and, uh, and it's, it's set out like an early 17th century Dutch sort of portrait. So yeah. the other thing, sticking with the, um, uh, sort of the drug addiction area uh, issue is that she wanted to, this to be a, a major sort of political picture. Right. Uh, clearly, the intention was to draw attention to you know this terrible plight of drug addiction um, amongst young people in New York in the early sixties. This was painted in nineteen sixty three. Um, it was the perfect year to paint a picture that she wanted to make a sort of political splurge because it was also the year that she was painting the president, JFK. Okay. So if we move on to this picture Yeah, I over just want to say one detail about sure. this painting because I think it's, it's just fascinating. She, de Kooning at one point um, wasn't allowed to take the painting home because the director of the center, if I'm not mistaken, said, you know, it's, it's for privacy issues, 
you can't take it away from the center. And so she actually ended up painting over with acrylic paints the faces of, oh. the, of the characters. And then when, as soon as she got home, she restored the painting, and removed the acrylic. Yeah. Uh, well, no, they were just, she just took the, the acrylic painting, paint off yeah. and then, you know, exhibited as she saw fit, et cetera. But this was a, a little sort of um, trick. I you see, know, yeah, so she, she paints had... over them and then removed the overpaint. Yes. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, it yes. was the perfect time to paint something that she wanted to, to make a sort of political statement with in 1963, because in 1962, she'd been given a commission by the Truman Library in Missouri to paint a picture of, of the president, JFK. Right. So she sits with him in December 62 and January 63, and um, during 1963, apart from painting the burgers of Amsterdam Avenue, she pretty much spent the, the whole year uh, painting paintings of, of JFK. Right. Um, of which this is, this is one. Um, he's then assassinated in the November 63. Uh, and seeing as she's been so focused on this, this commission, um, she um, then goes into a sort of period of... of of mourning, if you like, and, and doesn't really paint much in 1964, um, and then finally delivers the original commission to the Truman Library in February 1965, so almost three years after it was the original commission. Yeah. Sure. This is a, right. the original 1964 um, oh, okay. Uh, okay. magazine. Uh, and this is another version that she painted in 63. So I think this is like the second or third largest one that she, that she that did. She it's, did. It's about eight feet high. And, uh, and it's also got him in this sort of wonderful pose, you know, legs open, very Beautiful. casual. And yet he's the president, you know. Yeah. She was actually hired because she was famous for producing um, portraits in one sitting. Yeah. You know, and she ended up working for years. Yeah, you know? on this and, one, yeah. Uh, she, she mentioned having to, on some level, um, you know, take into consideration the pub, his public image hmm. as well and the fact that he was photogenic and very photo overexposed. Um, but I think this painting you know, shows how interested she was in gesture and rather than face. And that's yeah. something you can tell us about when we look at the other portraits. But in the letter, in her acceptance letter to be chosen as the portraitist, I remember his quote was, or the quote was, um, Elaine de Kooning is a, is a painter suitable to the president. Oh, right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Which I love. I love that. Um, Excellent. That idea. <laughs> what are we seeing here, Chris? Well, actually, um, I, I own a number of the of Elaine de Kooning portraits, which are tremendously important. In fact, she had a, a show at the National Portrait Gallery in Washington in 2015, a major retrospective of her portraits. Um, this is earlier. This is 1954. So this is the time when Willem de Kooning is probably painting his most important female pictures uh, as well. And um, I like this uh, picture intensely because I just find the abstraction and the brush strokes just completely wild and it's an unbelievably masterfully painted uh, picture. Um, again, take away the, the head and the feet and you would have no idea um, that this was a portrait from any distance. Yeah. Uh, it really is only when you see the head and the feet are on top of this and stand back that you see it's a portrait. Yeah, the that brush, point's really clear here. Yeah, yeah. the brushed work, the layering is really just, just extraordinary. I think this is just an amazing, amazing picture. Um, and just touching on, on the, the faces, the reason that she didn't paint the details in uh, of the faces was that um, she always said that she felt that you, you learned more about a person from their posture, the way that they yeah. carry themselves. And she really wants to try and sort of bring that through uh, in a portrait rather than just painting a portrait of someone. Because when you look at a normal portrait of someone, the first thing you do is look at the face and the yes. expression on the face. Yes. So she wanted to do the opposite. So you just look at this sort of mass of color and the general sort of 
feeling of the person and the general sort of position of the person. So this painting's later. So we see a number of actually more contemporary pictures around the house. Um, so they're mostly abstract expressionist, 40s to 60s, but some of them are a little bit later. Yeah. Uh, but I just want to talk about this because it's an important picture. It's 1972. It's by um, an African-American artist called Howardina Pindell. Uh, she, I believe, was the first African-American female curator of a major U.S. museum. Uh, and she was a curator in the prints and drawings department at MoMA from 1967 to 1977. Um, she did a series of, of paintings around this time, around 1972. So they're probably her most famous works. And um, she punched a hole uh, or holes into pieces of card right. and then sort of spray or dapple painted through the holes. So it's basically made up of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dots. And um, so it has this lovely kind of sort of shimmering feeling to it. So yeah. she's one of the most important African-American uh, painters of the 20th century. Uh, and sculptors, actually, and um, she's still uh, alive and well, still and still and working, well. actually. Uh, so uh, not only the 20th century, but the 21st too. Right. And um, I just love this work, and uh, I think this is the largest one that she did of that of that series. And um, I wonder, uh, I wonder if the camera can get because you see, it, there's a lot of movement in it actually with this technique that you're talking about. And was she in, the inventor of this technique, or was it something that was being used? Well, um, it's, well, it's kind of a sort of a pointillism of sorts, I suppose. Yeah. Although to um, to do it through card rather than doing it with a paintbrush. Um, uh, could be a sort of, I guess, a, a, a unique and pioneering sort of idea at the time. So uh, um, I guess stenciling isn't, wasn't a new technique, but, but the idea of, of making one of these works purely of dots is really, uh, really extraordinary. It's actually the kind of work that when you see it in a PDF, it just looks like a black square. Yeah. It's the kind of work you really have to see live to, yeah. to really appreciate it. It's true. Towards the corner, you can see more possibly on camera. Yeah, well, you can see the background is, is sort of a deep red. Um, but then, um, you know, it shimmers with this sort of, you know, navy blue and, and black and, and different sort of, um, different sort of dark blue sort of shimmerings. So it's got this kind of like lovely sort of crimson and a navy sort of uh, flow to it. It's it, a very meditative painting because the more you look at it, the more you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's really, uh, it's really an amazing, amazing piece. I wish we had more time because there's so many pieces beyond the abstractionists that really, um, you know, are worth talking about and worth looking at. And uh, but I wanted to ask you, and we'll get on this side here. We've just looked at the de Kooning's and the Kennedy yeah. and the Burgers of Amsterdam Avenue, but we have some more portraits as well. We by do. De Kooning. Um, we do. But do you want to just say a couple of words about this painting? Because yeah. Because I know it has a story. This has a bit of a story. So this is by an artist called uh, Amaranth Ehrenhout, um, who is probably just slightly later than, than many of the others. Um, it's called Jump In and Move Around, and it's 1962. And uh, it's a billion colors in, this, in yeah. this picture, as one can see. It's, it's really, really spectacular. Um, so it was painted in 1962, and it went straight into an exhibition in, in Paris, a multi-artist exhibition. Um, the exhibition was written up by a chap called John Ashbury in the uh, Herald Tribune at the time. So he's says lovely things about the exhibition, and he particularly picks out this, this painting and says that it's you know, one of the, the great pictures in the exhibition. So several weeks or months later, Amaranth Ehrenhout uh, runs into him, I think at a gallery opening or something, and uh, goes up to him. This is according to Amaranth Ehrenhout yeah. <laughs> and an interview with her, um, and says to him, um, oh, you know, Thank you. It's so amazing what you wrote, and you know, thanks for the great write-up. And uh, he turns around to her and says, "Oh, Amaranth," he said, "I thought you were a man. If I'd have known you were a woman, I wouldn't have painted. I, I wouldn't have written that." So, so. so uh, but 
Why? Because it was he would have been taking a st making a stand or well, it's an extraordinary a... thing, isn't it? Really, I mean, I, I, I mean, getting back to the point about why did so many of them disappear, um, other than maybe Lee Krasner and, yeah. and Joe Mitchell? And actually, although having said that, even a sculptor like Dorothy Denner had a retrospective at the Jewish Museum in New York in 1965 and another one at the Cleveland Museum of Art in 1993. Right. And yeah, if you said Dorothy, everyone knows David Smith, nobody has a clue who Dorothy Denno is hardly, yeah. but they should do. Um, part of it, I think, is probably because when you look at the art history books that were written in the late 20th century, whether they're about abstract expressionism mm. or about generalist art history, right women are almost entirely, if not entirely in some cases, without naming the authors, completely written out of them. Right. So I guess when students are studying art history, or you pick up a book on abstract expressionism up until recently, or you pick up a book on the history of art, um, there's almost no women artists in it, or, or they're completely written out of it. Right. So there seems to be this period where, even though there was, you know, women artists have operated hugely in the mid to late 20th century, we could all name, you know, you know a dozen of them, but, but um, somewhere along the line, uh, you know, an overly large amount of them have just got sort of lost in the works. Right. The only thing that I can think of for that, um, because plenty of women have been gallerists throughout time and plenty of women collect. I yeah, mean, you know, often yeah. it's the women that are collectors while they're, you know, and, uh, and their husbands, you know, you know, are running their companies and traveling around the world and this kind of thing. And not that their wives don't run businesses and run lives and, you know, whatever, but, but often it's the wives that collect definitely as much as the men. Right. So the only thing that seems to be outstanding to me is that they've been written out of the they were written out of the history books in the yeah. late 20th century for about 30 or 40 years or so. And that seems to be the outstanding thing. Although, having said that, less women were, um, were painting in general. So, I mean, in the Ninth Street show in 1951, right. there was 11 female artists, but there were 75 artists in the show overall. So there was definitely less opportunity for women in society. Um, and then you get into the legal reasons for that, so, um, which of course Justice Ruth Ginsburg, who became the first female uh, member of the Supreme Court, was actively changing this from the sort of the late mm. 60s onwards and did mm. all this sort of great work. But um, what seemed to be happening is that there was numerous laws in America that were kind of sort of there to cajole women to stay at home and also a number of laws that tried to sort of force men out to work. Mm. Um, and the idea was, was to protect the family unit. Right. But by doing that, of course, it suppressed women's ability to work. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, uh, you know, society-wise, not many of them were then just going off and becoming artists. Right. Some right. did, but it would have been the minority. But I think, I think an interesting point that we can take from this whole discussion too is that critics have s played such a fundamental role in making artists in general and women artists memorable um, and that's true today as well you know it's it's not just the art production but it's who's talking about the art who's who's collecting the art etc and mm. and the documentation of it whether it's through shows or whether it's through catalogs etc um, I, you know, it's, a, it's very essential that we start talking or continue talking um, now because I imagine since you started collecting um, a few years ago, was it 2008 that you started collecting? Well, I've been collecting for 27 years now since I was 25 right. in different right. areas and I've jumped around over the years. Yeah. And, and the museum, which we opened in 2011, is, is uh, Roman, Greek, and Egyptian antiquities shown alongside artworks from the 16th century to today, which have classical themes. But I started collecting purely post-war, actually about eight years ago, and I was collecting male and female artists, um, so I wasn't particularly discriminating between the two, but yeah. then the more research I did, the more interesting the female side just became. I mean, right. there's a trend in collecting female artists in general at the moment and yeah. artists, multicultural artists and things and you know everyone's trying to correct the fact that right. the media worked out 10 years ago that 95% of 
of artworks on museum walls were by white male artists. Right. But there was a slightly different path for me. I was collecting male and female uh, uh, post-war artists, which was a conscious decision that I made about eight years ago. So I bought sort of Joe Mitchell, Helen Frankenthala, Lee Krasner, um, and, um, but I also bought you know, David Smith, Basquiat, Keith Herring, Wayne yeah. Thiebaud, and wasn't really, I just bought pictures that I thought were sort of masterpieces. Um, and then, but then I sort of bought the Denver catalog and I bought uh, Elaine de Kooning's portraits catalog. Um, and then the book Ninth Street Women came out. So then I got really interested in Grace Hartigan and Elaine de Kooning. Um, and then I just sort of got interested in, in the whole area and just thought that, wow, this is a whole area of, of underappreciated right. uh, artists that should just all be brought back to the fore. And there were so many works on the market at the time by these amazing artists that had been shown in Betty Parsons back in the 50s or yeah. had been in sort of major museum shows and they were on the market for not, relatively speaking, so much money. Mm -hmm. Has that so, changed? I'm going to... We'll continue um, up the stairs, but just it's an interesting discussion in terms of collecting. You know, well, if you've seen a change in recent years as the popularity of it's changed. Of um, it's changed. It's changing all the time. So I mean, this is a more appreciated area now yeah. for, for sure, and people are getting to grips with Elaine de Kooning, Grace Hartigan, right. and uh, the other artists um, who are major, major artists at the time. Uh, Paul Fine. Uh, Mary Abbott, um, yeah. Ethel Schwarbacker, Pat Pasloff, Judith Godwin. Um, and um, so, yeah, you know, it's definitely percolating now and, and, and the prices are, are moving quite sharply. Chris, I wanted to move us along yeah, a little sure. bit. Um, and if the camera can just get these two portraits of Elaine de Kooning, which are separated by a generation. Um, you yeah. just want to tell us really quickly about them? So just super quick, um, this is a, actually a very early portrait by her. This is 1944. So this is the year after they got married, and at this point she's 26 years old. And this is 1965, so 21 uh, years later. So here she's uh, 47, and, um, and uh, just starting to sort of paint again, again, following the sort of the, you know, the JFK situation in 63 and 64, and um, uh, starting to feel the trials of life you feel in, in, in her face in that, in that picture, yeah. I love, I love the one from the 60s, particularly. So here we have a painting called Black Pagoda, as one uh, can see why. Uh, painted in um, 1959. It was in a show at the Betty Parsons Gallery in 1959. Uh, it's by the artist uh, Judith Godwin, who was uh, actively showing from the, from the early to mid 50s. Um, below it, we have a 1959 bronze bull from uh, one of Elaine de Kooning's, one of only a handful of sculptures that she, that she ever did. It's a unique piece. And um, Really, it's an amazing piece of work, this, because you really see, actually it weighs about 12 kilos. Oh my gosh. You really see the, it almost looks like a leather hide in the work, and the bull is kind of like big shouldered and charging it's away. It's really uh, an amazing uh, sculpture by her. Can so, I touch it? Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's, it's solid. Wow. Yeah, and you can see, still see all the... So I wanted to ask our guests to remember this bull, because we're soon going to see a bullfight. Painting. Painting. Yeah. Okay, so keep this in your minds. Um, but, well, on the Betty Parsons yeah. theme, maybe we'll take a look at a Betty Parsons picture. So yeah. as well as being one of the major gallerists of the period, she was also uh, a painter and a sculptor herself, actually. So uh, this is a 1957 uh, work by her, uh, looking out. Um, brilliant, brilliant use of colour. Yeah. I mean, the blue is absolutely spectacular, and this slightly mustardy sort of uh, yellow is, uh, is really lovely. And then on occasion, she would sort of inscribe um, these sort of designs into a picture. 
Uh, I'm not too sure whether she just used the back of the paintbrush and span it around or, or whether she, uh, she did it using some kind of implement. But her pictures are, are really, really stunning and she's an, really an amazing colorist. And did she continue painting for a long while or did she have a period in which she painted? I think she painted throughout her career actually. Her sculptures are actually uh, pretty interesting as well. But the paintings, I just think, are, are spectacular. They're beautiful. Yeah. They're beautiful. But she's one of the influencers that we've been talking about over the course of the talk, um, of choosing women, perhaps, and and um, absolutely displaying them. Yeah, I mean, she had a you know a good roster of of uh, women artists. Although she did famously say once something along the lines of of um, I prefer showing the males because because I sell the males more easily. Um, I think that goes along the, the, the lines of the Amaranth Ehrenhaus situation that um, unfortunately, you know, there was this, I guess, terrible sort of social thing at the time, which was a legacy thing throughout history of, of, of that, um, you know, you wanted something by a male rather than a female. Um, but, you know, it's good that society now and, um, and the art market for this period is now starting to correct that. But yeah. when you look at the prices, of course, you know, there's a, there's a long way to go. <laughs> and yes. that's not to say that, that they will even up completely, you know, what, um, but, um, but clearly the, 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 the whole area is, is just massively underappreciated and, and that's just, you know, changing rapidly now. Mm. But it's still just sort of in the early throes of that. It's really... Um, you know, we talk about the Denver show has been a seminal show, I mean, it's at least six years ago. Exactly. And it's, you know, although there's a huge number of shows now occurring, uh, bringing these artists along. So, and are I mean, some of your babies amount. participating in these shows? Yeah, yeah. So we, we've got several works on loan in Berlin right now. And then actually there's a Frankenthaler exhibition right now in, in, uh, in Krems in Austria that we've also loaned to. So all our four Frankenthaler paintings are, are away. Uh, then uh, we're loaning, I think, 15 works. Myself and actually my brother owns several of these pictures as well. Um, uh, to the Albertina Museum in uh, Vienna. And then I have some works going to uh, Oslo. And then I have about 40 works in the Whitechapel Gallery wow. uh, Museum tour that goes to France and then goes to Germany. So that's, uh, I forget how many paintings are in. I mean, it's well over 100 pictures, of course, in the show. but. Uh, but this collection makes up a, um, a, you know, a bit of a spine of that show, so as it were. So for our guests, they have some places to go, some cities to visit, right? Absolutely, to see absolutely. Parts of your collection. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. There's a huge year. amount going yeah. on. In fact, the Artists on Museum in Japan is having a show next year, which also includes a lot of these, uh, these artists. They're a major museum in Tokyo as well, and they've been collecting in this area. Um, it's all great news. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. think there's one or two things that are percolating in the US for 2024, 25, and 26, too. So, so a lot of museum shows coming up, which is also good for the space, of yeah. course. Yeah. yeah, definitely. So here we are at Pearl Fine. Yeah, so Pearl Fine was in the Ninth Street show. Um, she had her first show at the Willard, Willard Gallery in uh, New York in 1945. This is a 1954 picture by her. Okay. Um, called, which we've recently found out, actually, it was, or is called, Lacerated Yellows. Now, um, we felt that there um, is always a bit of Mondrian mm -hmm. in this, because mm -hmm. it, it seems to be a sort of abstract tabletop, but it's absolutely clear that yeah. the painting is cut into maybe Mondrian-esque yes. type squares. Um, and... Exactly. This being a sort of lattice of yellow lines as well, you can see how her friendship with Pierre Mondrian in the early 40s has come through in this 1954 Definitely. picture. It's absolutely unmistakable. But Chris, the fact that before it was untitled and now it's lacerated yellow, I mean, lacerated yellow, that's quite a statement, right? Did it change how you feel about the picture or? Well, you know, it made that greater connection between her and Mondrian. I mean, at, at first it just seemed like it was a picture that she cut into squares, but was otherwise a, you know, a, a largely abstract picture. The fact that it was then called lacerated yellows then reminded me of this sort of lattice 
style of yeah. uh, of painting where the where Mondrian goes from sort of the big squares mostly in white with maybe one red you know one blue to this painting 1942 quite a famous picture by him that's a lattice of of yellow lines so then the lacerated yellow just made me think of that lattice network of yellow lines and then Mondrian's painting of 42 just completely is directly reflected in this 1954 yeah. painting yeah. by Pearl Fine, who has such, you know, this, this close sort of connection with him. Chris, we're in the chocolate room. Oh, um, we are. Yes, yeah. which is such a nice name for a room. <laughs> I think we should spend a long time in here. Um, well, the last time we met, we had a massive three meter high, two meter wide yeah. Helen Frankenthaler here, which is now in Berlin, in Potsdam, in the Barberini Museum there. So here we have a Pat Pasloff. This is 1958, and she studied under Willem de Kooning in the late 1940s under Black Mount, in Black Mountain College, uh, moved to New York, very much became part of the scene, uh, was constantly friendly with the de Koonings, um, and then uh, later in the 1950s married the abstract artist Milton Resnick. So it was another sort of um, uh, artist sort of marriage, if you like, although both Milton Resnick and Pat Pasloff were long established artists on the scene before they got married in the, in the late 1950s. So um, oddly enough, this painting is called Promenade for a Bachelor. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. uh, so Do you know why? I don't, actually, and um, one can maybe imagine that this is a sort of uh, a couple promenading and oh. walking along a boardwalk or something. Uh, maybe this is some kind of foliage as it's green going on over here. Yeah. Uh, and however you can pick out one or two people in, in this sort of centre of the picture, you know, one can sort of uh, ha have a few thoughts. Um, and, uh, but I actually think that Pat Pasloff is just such an incredible artist and uh, use of colour, depth of colour uh, and just the composition overall is just spectacular and they're always lively, happy, stunningly beautiful pictures. She really is an, an extraordinary uh, artist. She does a lot of layering, and it's it's quite plastic almost in the sense, almost sculptural, you know, in some parts. Yeah, trend, you know, tremendously heavy in pasta around here, really all over the painting. Yeah. It's very, again, you'd have to sort of see it live, but but tremendously thick paint and just layer upon layer upon layer. So it's a you know, it's a gazillion colours. It's nice when you say they're happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I find Yvonne Thomas, uh, who we'll talk about soon, and Pat Pasloff, tremendously happy oh, pictures. That's they lovely. really are. It's lovely. And actually, as is uh, Miriam Shapiro, uh, another great artist of, of the period, who starts developing her style in the mid to late 50s. This is a 1956 picture by her called Idol 2. And it was actually shown in a group show in MoMA in 1956. So, uh, which is a, obviously a nice provenance. Now, um, the last time we spoke, and it's actually been a good idea to sort of update our conversation as we've sort of discovered so much, yeah. uh, myself and my sort of research team, uh, about these pictures, you know, new names and, and uh, things. Now, um, we thought that this was a sort of tabletop scene with a sort of plainish background, and we thought this was sort of a water jug and ah. various things going on. That's not the case at all. What we've now discovered is that this is a scene from a Charlie Chaplin movie. Oh, my. Uh, and there's three figures in this picture. Uh, one over here, one in the middle, try and find that one, and one over on the far left-hand side. So much of like this area around here, and this, what we know now to be a figure over here, is just tremendously you know, vibrant and quite thickly painted. So um, it's, really, uh, it's really a beautiful picture. It really is. And it, and it actually speaks very nicely with the Pavlov, I have to say. Yeah, and painted it's two years really apart. Yeah. You know, the, uh, the, you could just feel the vibrancy of the 1950s. You know. Yeah, there was a little uh, bit of optimism happening in the 1950s. 
Really and then you have this vibrancy. Brightness. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, another vibrant picture here um, above, actually, a 1977 unique piece by Louise Bourgeois. But above it, in contrast, in contrast, we have another bright, beautiful, <laughs> spectacular uh, 50s picture. It's by Ethel Schwabacher. Uh, it's 1956. Um, I have a Cosmopolitan magazine from 1961 that bills her as one of the major female artists of the period. And she talks about, or the article talks about, a lot about Grace Hartigan and Elaine de Kooning, Helen Frankenthaler. And um, even though it's you know, largely red, it's the red's you know, been painted on top of you know, sort of mass of greens and oranges and blues and purples. And then they're kind of like interlaced together in, in some areas. It's stunning sort of pink in the middle. And uh, it's a lot of freedom, a lot, lot of freedom in it. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, what do you see in this picture when you when you look at it? That's what I see is freedom that she there's freedom of movement, even yeah. of energy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think that that's that was one, maybe one of the most exciting things about the expression expressionist abstractionism, you know, yeah. that they were suddenly not necessarily going by the quote unquote rules. It was very, you know, the canvases were large, you know, yeah. um, color and that color. I was thinking before of, of a quote by um, Fine, Pearl Fine, and she said, my paintings speak the only language I know, color. Yeah. And, and looking, you know, being inside the chocolate room, that's what I'm thinking is, is it was a language, a whole new language that they were discovering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to push you in this direction because um, uh, the Lou is in that direction. Uh, yeah, yeah. And you have wonderful photos. Okay, let's, let, um, let's just uh, yeah, have So a I'm just going to send you in there by yourself. Yeah, I'll actually. come in with a photographer actually. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> We can have. Uh, it's not a habit of mine to uh, to <laughs> to draw people into the into the loo with me. Generally speaking, we'll have Francesca, the filmmaker, is following you in. <laughs> yeah. Um. Um, but uh, I've been collecting photographs of the period actually, and uh, which are tremendously um, interesting. So um, and they really sort of bring back the time to you. So some fantastic photographs of sort of Jackson Pollock, Lee Krasner. Uh, this uh, the one below it's uh, an early picture of Elaine and Willem de Kooning by Ellen Auerbach a portrait of her husband Walter Auerbach is downstairs that we took a look at um, and then um, what's interesting is either you know they, they sort of show you the social scene of the period too so I mean in particular there's this great picture here so the main tavern where a lot of the, the artists were hanging out was the Cedar Tavern or the Cedar Bar. Uh, this is in the Five Spot, which was another one of their, the sort of bars that they frequented. And in this one picture alone, you, you have David Smith, Helen Frankenthaler, uh, Frank O'Hara, um, the, uh, the poet Larry Rivers, Grace Hartigan, all there in 1957. And even what's kind of interesting is they've got a sort of board at the back with the Atelier Gallery uh, having, a, uh, having a show of someone or another. And um, so it's just, a, they're just amazing pieces of, of social history. And um, so uh, I've really sort of enjoyed collecting it's the photographs as well. And there's a wonderful one here of, uh, yeah. of Mitchell Frankenthaler and uh, Krasner at a Frankenthaler opening. Uh, um, it's really quite a... Um, oh, this is such a lovely one. I'm going to go to the other side of the painting over here. Okay. <laughs> Ta-da! So, so this is a 1977 Joan Mitchell. It's the best part of three meters high. Yeah. And I forget how wide, probably, I don't know, 180 or something like that. So she has a sort of interesting story because, you know, she's painting in New York through uh, the 1950s. She's originally from Chicago, but she always had a sort of love affair with France from the late 40s onwards and was a regular sort of visitor to France. Um, she then has an over 20 year relationship with a Canadian artist, uh, Jean-Paul Riopel, and they moved to Paris in, in 1959. 
By this time, 1977, uh, they've moved out of Paris and uh, are living in a, a village called Versailles, which is next to Giverny, where, um, where Monet lived for, in the later years of his life and painted his famous water lily pictures. So, uh, so she did a series of pictures throughout this time in the sort of late 1970s that are sort of Monet water lily-esque, yeah. of which this is one. And uh, again, it's a picture that really needs to be seen live because there's areas where the impasto yes. is literally, I mean, a quarter of an inch thick all over it. It's really, really quite incredible. I mean, whole just lumps of paint here, here, yeah. and, you know, throughout the... Uh, I feel like this... I have to get further away uh, to, to be able to really see it. Yeah. It's very water lily esque. In fact, I, uh, yeah. I went to the, the show in the Barberini Potsdam Berlin at this sort of post war abstraction to see some of the paintings that we have on loan there. And um, they have a permanent collection of uh, Impressionism and, um, and have a lot of Monets in the collection, have sort of become famous for it. Yeah, um, because it's, it's such an interesting, I mean, even just that simple detail. Yeah, that it was in some way responding to the water lilies changes how you how you see it how you look at it. Uh, absolutely. absolutely. This statue was from a similar this area. Is, this is uh, Ile de France, so yeah, a similar area in northern France. So uh, yeah, I pointed out because I always like to see how the sculpture is talking to the paintings and what sort of connections they have. I mean, two pieces that you would say there is no relation, but geographically. Uh, geographically, yeah, they're, they're extremely, extremely yeah. close. Yeah. Uh, but it also shows you how, you, which is something that we do a lot in the, in the museum in, in Mujan, you know, we show the ancient versus the modern. Right. And the pieces talk to each other, you know, sort of perfectly. Although there we might show a 2,000 year old Roman statue of Aphrodite next yeah. to like Eve Klein's Aphrodite, Dali's Aphrodite, and, right. and a drawing of the Venus de, de Milo by Cezanne. So like you've got all these like very direct comparisons. Also, the blue works for the Madonna. Yeah, you know, yeah, it does. For yeah. some reason. Yeah, yeah. But we yeah. have two other very important pieces in this room. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to ask if you would talk to us just a little bit about the Grace um, Hardigan. Yeah, so this is probably one of um, Grace Hardigan's most important pictures in, in private hands. And uh, early 50s pictures are, are, are quite rare. Um, What's absolutely fantastic about Grace Hartigan, apart from the fact that actually she was the most successful women artist of the 1950s, is that she wrote a daily diary from 1951 to 1955, right. where she talks about the picture, all the pictures that she's painting and what's happening in her daily life. Uh, and then you can see what she's thinking you know, about your painting as she's painting it. But this is the time, so early 50s, the art scene's really building, um, prices are going up, and um, the people are buying more than they were sort of during the 1940s of for, of for an course. array of obvious reasons. And, um, and now they're all starting to make some money. So, um, and sometimes in the case of Pollock, who really kind of hit it big before anybody else, right. and maybe other than Robert Motherwell in sort of, uh, from around sort of 46, 47 onwards when he's starting his drip paintings. Um, by 1952, 53, several more of them are now starting to have some money coming in from these gallery and shows. And she was one of them. She was one who was purchased by galleries. At Abs this time. Absolutely. So um, she was represented by the Tibor Denage Gallery, which still exists in New York, um, and uh, showed abstract expressionists both then and now. Um, this is the time when she's painting under George Hartigan. So. What's interesting is that when you see a Tibor Denage uh, sort of gallery poster, it says George Hartigan on the top. She was signing the paintings, just Hartigan, and she would turn up to the opening. So, so everybody would see that she, she wasn't a male uh, and she'd turn up as Grace Hartigan. And she is at this point, the biggest female artist in New York and one of the biggest artists overall. In fact, her gallery shows were, were largely selling out she had well, a you, you really want yeah. 50s Hartigans yeah. or, or first half of the 1960s is really... And there's a huge price disparity there as well. I right. mean, like 10 times the price. Right. So, so the market accounts for that. 
So it's um, recognized. It's recognized that that's her period. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, okay, your favorite. One page, of one of uh, yeah one of, one, of, one of my favorite. One, oh, it's a bit like Pat Paslov. It's yeah. actually another one that's not so well known, uh, although it's really starting to to move at auction now and get uh, and uh, you really sort of see her works heavily exhibited and there's more sort of uh, interest there. And that's Yvonne Thomas. So. Um, and she was in the Ninth Street show. She was one of the 11 women that was in the 75 artist show in 1951. Leo Castelli's first show in America, another one that goes on to become one of the biggest gallerists of the late 20th century. Tremendously important she was in that show and exhibited heavily throughout the 1950s. And uh, this is a 1956 work by her. And again, I just love her works. I mean, a bit like, you know, Pat Pasloff, they're alive. Yeah. vibrant, colorful. It's very soothing too. I mean, although it's colorful, there's, it's much, it's a, it's a quieter happiness than the other ones that we've looked at. Yeah, uh, I mean, Pasloff is sort of, you know, powerful, packs a punch. Yeah. This, this, uh, I, yeah, I see what you say. You've got all this beautiful color. I mean, all these different types of sort of, you know, pink. Uh, it's really a fuchsia sort of colors. Beautiful. It's really sort of amazing, um, and yet at the same time, it's it's a much softer uh, sort of feeling that you sort of uh, that you, you sort of get from it. I just um, learned recently that hot pink was invented right around this time. Oh, um, yeah, by Elsa, as an individual as in, color. Yeah, as right, an individual okay. color in the fashion world. Uh -huh. um, okay. And so it's interesting that she's using a lot of pinks. Um, you know, right. we could probably argue whether color can be invented. Uh, oh, but, well, yeah. actually, um, I mean, this is the emergence, I guess, the sort of late 50s, uh, talking of Florence and fashion of, uh, of the yeah. Pucci brand and the Pucci yeah. family, who are this amazing Renaissance family still living in the same, same Renaissance Palazzo. palace here that they've lived in for 600 years. Right. And Emilio Pucci, I think, was developing that brand in, in the late 50s and, and 60s. And of course, they're noted for their they're extraordinarily beautiful and bright sort of yeah. uh, color patterns. In so, fact, uh, it's interesting to, to look at this painting from a fashion point of view. You know, it was probably also in conversation. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, Pucci yeah. does use a lot of these colors, you know. Absolutely. Just, I mean, yeah. they're, they're noted for, for their extremely bright and beautiful colors, yeah. Pucci. So uh, that's really what the, uh, the Pucci designs are. Are, are all about are so certainly yeah. the, the the thing that you sort of uh, you remember uh, Pucci for, amongst the fact that it's sort of you know amazing sort of design in itself. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I can't describe a lady's dress quite as well as I can describe. No, a I, I can imagine. And why would you? Why would you? Uh, okay. So here, this is another obviously beautiful room. And and Francesco, when you when you come in, if you could give the whole sort of overview of the room so that our guests can have a look um, before we look at a couple of the paintings. Uh, and I know Pazlov is, is one that we will be looking at. Yeah. So, you know, we talked a bit about her before. There's now a Pazlov and Resnick Foundation in New York, which does uh, exhibitions, etc. So that can be visited. Um, this is another painting where we've discovered a little bit more uh, about it. Um, so we talked last time about some 1959 Pasloff, it's called Stove. Um, and at first it just looks like a massive like, pale blue, yeah. which it is. Um, but when you look at sort of, you know, the background of the picture, you've got these millions and millions of sort of detailed reds, yellows, um, and uh, oranges. It's very, very detailed and very, very heavily painted. So she does this hugely, hugely detailed abstract picture. It must have taken her forever. And then she paints over it sort of 80% in light blue. So it's called Stove. So as we sort of discussed before, this is seemingly an American stove. We think the light blue paints is the steam coming off the stove. Uh -huh. And you've got the kind of red heat going on behind it. Yeah, but I have to say, I mean, what I can't imagine having done an entire painting 
and then covering it up. It really is an exercise in detachment, you know. Well, Although it, she, you know, she does a, a second layer above in this beautiful blue, but but really, I, it's amazing. Well, absolutely, because the thing is, when you look at it from a distance, you think it's basically a big blue painting. Yeah. Um, so again, I, I uh, there's something about Yvonne Thomas and Pat Pasloff that I just think is uh, is blockbuster. Um, really fascinating. And, in, in and, interesting. Well, talking of blockbusters. Yeah, talking of blockbusters because it's a totally different place. We're in a totally different place yeah. with, with the bull. Yeah. With de Kooning. So Elaine de Kooning visits these bullfights in, in Mexico around 1957-58 and then paints this one of, again, one of her most famous series, the bullfight series, um, around that time, 58-59. And... Um, she does several, three or four of these, or five of these, which are, uh, which are like four meters wide, like the Burgers of Amsterdam Avenue wow. is like four and a half meters by about 180. Where are they? Well, one is in the permanent collection of the Denver Art Museum. Uh, one um, is in the Arson Museum in Tokyo, uh, interestingly, and then there's either another two or three, um, which may well be in museums or private hands, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure. Yeah. It's a fantastic charging bull. You can almost right. even see this sort of spears and feathers sort of sticking out the, you know, out of his sort of, uh, you know, the back of his shoulders and this sort of violent action. So here we are in the 1950s. It's 1959, and this is a time when Picasso in Europe is doing bullfight sort of uh, pictures around this state. So, uh, and of course, everybody knew who Picasso was, and Picasso would visit New York, you know, now yeah. and again. So uh, it's interesting that you've got Elaine de Kooning doing bullfight pictures because she's been to Mexico and seen bullfights. And uh, Picasso around the same time is having, you know, his bullfight kind of uh, fanaticism as well. So it's another kind of like interesting sort of connection. Yeah. They, she, she said at one point that to her painting or a painting is a verb, not a noun. And I see it so strongly in this because because it's a it's a static bull, quote unquote, but in movement. Oh, the absolute movement's unbelievable. Movement. It's amazing. It, it, it's absolutely unbelievable. She paints in movement tremendously. We have a cardigan. Well, yeah, well, we we'll just and, mentioned this one. Oh, this yeah. is a 1951-52 picture by Audrey Flack called um, Abstract Force Homage to Franz Klein, who she was friendly with. Of course, you see Franz Klein uh, within this. And um, I just want to mention Audrey, actually, because I exchanged the odd email with Audrey. She's still alive. She's the only one of these artists uh, that's, that's still alive, still working and painting. She's, mm. you know, in her mid-90s and, um, and really is a fantastic person uh, giving TV interviews and all sorts of things. So, so she really is uh, an amazing character. And this is, you know, her most famous picture. So, uh, and again, phenomenal date, 51, 52. Yeah. Emergence, the movement on mass, Ninth Street show, amazing. Well, yeah. there's a lot of movement happening right? <laughs> yeah. in the 50s, both in color and in actual movement. Yeah. What, you, what you see, beautiful. Well, we're going to have to send Audrey our conversation, the restoration conversation. I, I guarantee you, yeah. Audrey Flack would love to see our yeah. conversation. Yeah. She would, uh, uh, well, I can't speak for Audrey Flack, but right. I'm sure she would, yeah. she would love to see it. We, yeah. we hope she would. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so Grace Hartigan again, 1951. So I've uh, produced, uh, we've produced a book of the collection uh, of the abstract expressionist side of the collection, 1940 to 1970s. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, the two authors are Ellen Landau, um, who's a world famous academic in this area. Um, knew many of the artists personally, including Lee Krasner. She wrote Lee Krasner's catalogue raisonné in the 1990s, so she's basically the world's renowned expert on Lee wow. Krasner. And also uh, writing the book with her was, is um, Joan Marta, who's the editor-in-chief of the Women's Art Journal in America. She's the uh, director of the Dorothy Denner Foundation and is also... Uh, a hugely leading academic in the area, and both Ellen and Joan have curated numerous shows and really have been there as sort of a powerhouse sort of supporting the women. So to have those two people um, writing the book 
about my collection is 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 an unbelievable honor uh, to say the least and, and the book uh, the book is in pre-publication and it's coming out for the public yeah the, the book's just going through its sort of final edits final color proofing of the pictures and um, it's now available on Amazon can be pre-ordered on Amazon it's called abstract expressionism the women mm. so uh, amen <laughs> So type that in and yeah. it'll pop up on, on Amazon.com or uh, uh, Amazon.co.uk. I'm not sure if it's on the, the EU ones yet, but uh, uh, it's definitely on Amazon.com. Um, so this is 1951. Again, absolutely perfect date. What could be better than that? Um, this is called Cedar Bar and the Cedar Tavern. Cedar Bar was where so many of the artists used to hang out. Amazing. We saw we saw the photograph. Yes, yeah, so the yeah. photograph of the Cedar Tavern in the in the in the Louvre, yeah. and uh, the Five Spot as well. Another sort of hanging out of theirs, and um, but she talks about this this uh, painting in her diaries in 1951. It's just about the first painting that she mentions, and um, but in her diary she talks about it as being called Aries, which was Hartigan's um, star sign. And this is now the front cover of the uh, Abstract Expressionist, the Women, the women. catalog. So okay. it's the front cover picture for that. Um, actually, there was a Ninth Street show uh, sort of exhibition at the Katona Museum in, in upstate, I think it's upstate New York, and this was, this was in that show. But she talks about this as uh, Aries in uh, her, her book. And actually, when I bought it, I bought it as a picture, 1951, called Cedar Bar. And um, so I was sort of looking through the diary, the 1951 element, uh, and I couldn't find this picture, Cedar Bar, it wasn't in the index. So, uh, and I'd noticed from a 1954 picture that I have by her, a still life picture, that she changed the name of it about four or five times while she was painting it, uh, which is in one of the sort of back bedrooms here. So I thought, well, maybe this was called something else, and then she changed the name to Cedar Bar. So the first picture she talks about, it wasn't hard to find, <laughs> it's called Aries. And um, so I was trying to find, you know, a ram in the picture, yeah. you know, Aries the ram in the zodiac. Well, first of all, then you notice that R-A-M, ram, is written oh, in the picture. okay. Uh, I hadn't noticed that, but yeah. yes. No, it's I anyway, it's, it's crazy, yeah. And then, um, and then this is clearly a white sort of ram with the face mm -hmm. and the horns like that uh, and then it's um, you've got a sort of yellow pentacle which can be associated with the, the zodiac in the background that's largely been painted over and then the sign on the zodiac for Aries um, is this V because you know that you have oh, these right. kind of um, symbols yes. if you like so as well yeah. as the whether it's Taurus the ball Pisces the fish Gemini you know the twins whatever you also have a sort of symbol that represents the sign and in this case it's kind of a V that goes like that so she's painted over in this red here and clearly that seems to me to be the V but apart from the fact she's written ram on it and it's a picture of a ram <laughs> So then it's clear that this was Aries. This was Aries, but now it's Cedar Bar. So, it's, so within the, the, her journal, she's talking about this painting, Aries, Aries, Aries. And then uh, one day she says in her journal, she says, I absolutely, um, she says words along the effect, uh, uh, words to the effect of, um, I despise the name Aries. I hate the idea of calling a painting by a zodiac sign sign uh, name and I'm going to change the name of it but she doesn't say what to she changes it to Cedar Bar <laughs> so uh, that's the that's kind of the connection so um, but I wonder why she changed it to Cedar Bar that's the missing piece well who knows you know uh, she was frequenting the Cedar Bar at the time quite yeah. a little bit, bit so probably something to do with uh, with a night out there maybe Interesting. Um, Interesting colors. Yeah. An yeah. autumn night. Yeah. 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 Um, well, along the, there's a couple of sort of Joe Mitchell connections here. So we have a Joe Mitchell uh, on the other side of the staircase that we sort of walked past when we came up. So if we take the view of the, 
of the Mitchell and then look up at another uh, uh, Mike, Michelle Corrine West, Michael West. Um, this is by her as well. And this is really the emergence of her. Uh, this is 1949 and it's called nihilism. So um, nihilism obviously means the sort of utter destruction of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's obviously reminiscent of the Second World War, right. which had just, you know, which finished just four years before this was painted. She's used an unbelievable amount of sort of sand in the collage of this picture, um, which also makes you think of the word annihilation. You know, uh, it almost looks like a sort of bombs having gone off with, you know, layering of sand, sort of silvery gray, which right. sort of makes you think of metal in it. Um, and um, it just looks like a picture of utter destruction. So between the name, uh, you know, it's sort of multimedia and, and its composition, it's, it's an unbelievably powerful picture. And there was a show of sort of 100 years of female abstraction at the Pompidou Center last year, which we, which we loaned to. Uh, and this work actually didn't go in the show, but they gave it a full page picture in the catalogue, uh, mm. interestingly. So, uh, so it's, you know, it's an important picture. Um, in terms of how it's painted, aside from the, 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 the sand and the collage, behind it, it looks like a late 40s Jackson Pollock. Um, she's she's um, drip painted the picture uh, as a start, as a starting point. Um, and then she's created the sand and the collage and the devastation on top of it. So um, it's a tremendously complex uh, picture underneath it and a tremendously deep picture and uh, tremendously interesting seeing as, um, well, Janet Sobel is the one that's now tasked with sort of inventing this sort of drip painting technique. Uh, from in the early 40s and then Jackson Pollock goes to a show of hers and uh, sees that it. and then builds on it and right. then of course well, takes it into yeah, a whole different huh. sort of um, level measure you know yeah. but by a long way and um, so um, but I think we know that Jackson Pollock was at that show by Janet Sobel and saw those and right. commented on them right. and then he goes off and no one's I don't, don't think it'd stick their neck out and say that he copied her, but it's definitely a drip painting technique. Right. But he does something infinitely right. larger right. And, and more spectacular with it. I think this opens a door to a whole, the whole era of abstractionism, the yeah. destruction of World War II. Then opens the door to paintings where humans weren't the center. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. And actually, I own a Jan Janet Sobel, and actually that was one of the pictures that I loaned to the Pompidou Center last year. Uh, she's tremendously important, but the Sobel is not, is not here right now. And actually, I also own Lee Krasner's Prophecy, which is the painting that she was painting um, when Jackson Pollock died. Um, it's been in over 30 museum shows since 1982. Wow. And actually, the Barbican build it is basically her most important picture, and it was a sort of a change of direction for her. And um, there's a narrative between her and Jackson Pollock when she's painting it about how the painting's going. He's saying it's a great painting, you should definitely finish it. She goes to Paris on a sort of one month trip there. He dies in the car crash uh, while she's away. And then there's this famous photograph of her when she's back and prophecy is, is standing on the easel. So, um, but unfortunately that's not here. It's already en route uh, to the Albertina uh, ahead of some of the, the pictures which are being picked up in a few days' time. So, uh, so we're lacking Frankenthalers that are we're already out on, on uh, either, that are already either in Austria we'll or back. they're in Germany. And, we'll have uh, to come back. Yeah. Um, so another work from Grace Hartigan's journals, 1954. This is called Two Women. It's uh, Daisy Auden on the left, uh, who owned a literary magazine in New York, and her girlfriend, uh, um, Olga Petrov on the right and they were great friends with Grace Hartigan and um, so uh, uh, a bit like Elaine de Kooning not only did she paint pure abstraction um, she also painted uh, abstract portraiture uh, on occasion and actually as we get into the late 60s and beyond that's pretty much all she all she does um, but not in such a 
uh, a sensitive way as these earlier pictures. So in fact, um, the painting that Momo owns, the Persian jacket, is figurative, but it's tremendously, tremendously abstract. But the painting that the Whitney owns, uh, which is the same date as this 1954, is, is very figurative, you know, much the same as this. And, um, but nevertheless, you know, when you look at uh, Daisy Alden's dress here, it's really beautifully abstract and beautifully painted. Mm. And um, a little bit like Elaine de Cooney, you know, the faces are sort of, you know, quite sketchy, but you get a sense of, you know, of the expression. But it's really about the abstraction, their posture, and, uh, and, and color. And um, it really is a, you know, a stunning and important work. And, you know, she talks about the length in the diaries. And there's even a photograph of Daisy and Olga sitting together posing for the picture. So, uh, which is in her diaries as well. It's so wonderful. it's uh, the she's provenance. Talking about the paintings as well. Yeah, the provenance is really, really fantastic. So are we going into... Yeah, let's just take the... a quick look along the corridor. Yeah. That's a pretty important picture. It's uh, 1966, and it's called Rufus's Rock. And again, there's a, a great narrative from Mitchell with this picture. So again, so rare. Um, so at this point, she's living in Paris with uh, Jean-Paul Riopel. It's just before um, they move out to the countryside. Um, She's been in Paris since about 1959, but they holiday every summer in the south of France uh, around Jouan le pin which is next to Antibes. So, uh, so she's out sailing one day with a friend of hers, Rufus Zogbaum, and Rufus notices this rock uh, sort of sticking out of the, the, the lovely Mediterranean Sea around there um, and makes some kind of big deal about this rock. <laughs> Uh, she comes back to the studio and paints two pictures of Rufus's rock, Rufus Sogbaum, and this is one of those pictures. So this picture is Rufus's rock, 1966. And interestingly, I have a painting by Jean-Paul Riopel, uh, 1966, called Antibes, which is in my house in, in France. Um, and it's a similar color palette. It's, it's a lot of blue. It's got these little purples in it. So I just wonder if they were standing in the connected. studio next to each other, maybe even using the same paints. So actually, yeah. in the book of the Levitt collection, we, you know, we talk about that, the Riopel painting as well. And, uh, you know, really at some point, we've got to show them together. Uh, but uh, they're, they're different sizes, unfortunately. The Riopel is maybe about um, two thirds of the size of this. Uh, so they're, they're always going to look like a bit of a misma mismatch, but, uh, but nevertheless, you know, it'd be good to get them together at some point. Yeah. And there's a tiny bit of recollection. Well, this predated the other, the other one. Yeah, this is earlier. But there's so... a little bit of starting. That other painting, the one with, that recalls the water lilies. Yeah. A little bit of starting. Well, of often, that. you know, sometimes the paintings emerge from the center of the canvas. I mean, that's not unusual for, for Mitchell. So you've got these huge areas, super, super thick in, in pasto in the center of the canvas here. Yeah. Uh, and also on the top right, where you've got the background of, of you know, this sort of mauve purple. Um, actually, this is by uh, another painting by Pearl Fine. Uh, this one's a bit later, 1958. It's called Summer One. Uh, this was in the Denver Museum of Art uh, exhibition. Um, it's kind of interesting because it's got some, quite a lot of collage in it. She seems to have used other pieces of canvas, cut them out in sort of almost like Miro type uh, shapes, yeah. and then stuck them on the top and then sort of painted over them. And then also it's got these sort of strips of what looks like it's a very, very thin, thin steel or, or sort of aluminium uh, that's also sort of embedded in the, in the picture. Yeah, exactly, another piece here and a, another little piece up there on the right. So you've got this sort of mass of color, but uh, yeah, there again, but um, you know, the sort of aluminium effect built into it and all these sort of Miro-esque type shapes that are cut out and stuck on the top. And, but it's uh, less, it's less, um, square, less of a lattice. Oh yeah, this, this really has nothing to do with, with Mondrian at yeah. this point. This really is a just pure abstraction and 
you know, maybe she uses the, the collage to give it another sort of, um, you know, level of sort of light and depth. I mean, this is around the time when, you know, the zero movement is emerging in Italy. So you have Fontana um, and then sort of, you know, Castellani, uh, Bury is using, um, to, I mean, Bury's works are really all about collage or, or different materials. Creating and it's exploding plastic and all this yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, and making the, the canvas sculptural. So maybe it's a reference to, to that as, as well. Although having said that, Michael Corrine West was using um, you know, multimedia from the late 40s onwards. Uh, and, um, but definitely at this point, you know, late 50s getting into the 60s, you're starting to see um, a lot of sculptural sort of technique in the way that canvases are being used. So it could also be a, a sort of relationship with, with that dynamic as art is changing too. It's a really great picture. It's beautiful. And it's on its way to Vienna next week. It is. <laughs> yeah. um, above a little Louis Bourgeois claw. Oh, there we go. Uh, we have a beautiful have picture a by Charlotte Park. Uh, another tremendously interesting artist, uh, showed heavily throughout the 1950s. Um, and a different technique again, uh, these kind of sort of very, very, very thick layers of paint and then uh, almost like Gerhard Richter-esque, scraped down in some areas. So you see the paint mm. sort of come through um, much earlier than Gerhard Richter. This is 1955. <laughs> Uh, and uh, really is um, a spectacular picture and uh, I'm always amazed at how kind of thick the paint is on here um, and yet luckily over time it hasn't cracked so I do worry about this when it goes on tour because it's going to the Whitechapel Gallery Museum yeah. Fondation Van Gogh. Because that's the fragile part of the painting, yeah. the impasto. Exactly, then it's going to Germany so I just hope it comes back. From all its travel, it's in exactly the same condition as to, as to where it left. Having said that, it's been moving around since 1955, so it's done pretty well so far, so hopefully it's, it's stable. But touch wood, it, it makes it back. So they all make it back okay. Um, they will. Uh, yeah. They will. Uh, and then we're finished with abstract expressions, and with two, two uh, areas here, and then we'll have a quick look at the bedroom and go a little bit more modern just, just to finish off. So, um, so Hans Hoffmann was um, one of the major developers of, of the movement. So uh, he moved to New York, um, give or take around 1930, had moved there from Germany, had this background of German Expressionism. So Franz Marc, Kandinsky, Paul Klee, um, who of course were also abstract artists right. in, their, in their own way. Um, and um, so he uh, set up an art school and um, was started to bring abstraction of European abstraction at this point uh, and German expressionism into uh, into the New York area. Both and uh, he's the top one. No, his, his work is the top. So one. both these were drawn in um, Hans Hoffmann's studio. Okay. But they're both by female artists. Okay. So the top one is by Lee Krasner and dates to about 1940. And the bottom one is by Mercedes Matter, uh, 1937, who was also uh, an um, abstract uh, artist throughout the sort of 40s, 50s, uh, uh, and 60s, and did these sort of abstract pictures of, of largely vases of flowers. It's the series that she's, she's certainly the most known for. And, um, and she was great friends with Lee Krasner. In fact, they met because they'd been on a political march together, uh, both arrested and put in the same prison cell. Uh -huh. uh, and then, How lucky. Uh, I think it was Mercedes <laughs> Matter that introduced Lee Krasner to Hans Hoffmann's studio. Um, and, uh, and the movement is really building you know, from there. So um, yeah, so that's those. Actually, another one of the 11 ladies that was in the Ninth Street show um, is uh, a Swiss lady called Sonia Secular. This is a 1948 picture by her called 7AM. Uh, and it's basically a, uh, a New York cityscape picture. 
Um, this seems to be one of the bridges on the right down here, and you yeah. can see the, the various sort of buildings and towers. Um, spectacular picture by her. Um, she was in the Ninth Street show. Um, she showed with Peggy Guggenheim Gallery, the Art of the Century Gallery, that was Peggy Guggenheim's gallery that closed in 1947. And then she moves back to Europe after the war when Europe sort of becomes safer again. Uh, and then, of course, she develops the Peggy Guggenheim uh, Foundation and collection in, in Venice uh, shortly after that. But Sonia Secular was one of her major artists. And then after Peggy Guggenheim, I think she shows with Betty Parsons, I think, but then she goes to another gallery. Uh, but unfortunately, she suffered from very, very serious depression issues uh, and having lived for a long time in, in New York, moves back to Switzerland uh, around 1960 and uh, unfortunately commits suicide in 1961. Um, and uh, although there was a number of artists in the period, of course, that committed suicide. Um, and... Uh, um, it's just a beautiful, beautiful work by her. So even though it's sort of um, essentially a grey picture with sort of the black, you know, lines sort of abstractly outlining the city, you know, the, the little touches of yellow and blue and green uh, and sort of turquoise, it just really uh, just make it explode. It's yeah. really a, a, um, an amazing, amazing picture. So... Um, it yeah. does speak a lot about New York. It, it really yeah. does. It's, it's a perfect cityscape at 7 a.m., so uh, it's a good name. And then we won't go around the back, otherwise we're, no, <laughs> we're literally going to be can't. here for a year. We can't go around the back, but, <laughs> but we can go around uh, the front. But we can go around the front. I think we're yeah. finishing the bedroom, yeah. and um, just watch the step here, Francesco. But um, I absolutely love Tracy Emin. I've been lucky enough to get to know her uh, personally as well in, in, in recent years a little bit. And... Um, um, from around, let's say, 2012, this is 2012 to 2015, she does a series of uh, pretty large-scale tapestries, of which this is one. But it's actually one of my favourite works by her. Um, so, sticking with the Tracy Emin theme, yeah. um, after George Michael died, he had a... Uh, a sale of his works at Christie's, and he had a really, really important um, uh, collection of contemporary British artists. Uh, and in the evening sale, um, there was two amazing works that he owned by Tracy Emin. One painting called Hurricane, which I bought, uh, which is actually going out on loan. Uh, that's the way at the moment. So that's going to an exhibition actually here in Florence, the Palazzo Medici Riccardi. And um, and this blanket from her famous blanket series from, uh, from sort of the beginning of the 2000s. And um, so unbelievable provenance, the name Drunk to the Bottom of My Soul. And, um, you know, of course, one of uh, Tracy Emin's incredible sort of pieces of, uh, of writing or poetry uh, on it as well. Tremendously moving. And, um, you know, you've got sort of... Uh, Tracy Emin, one of the greatest uh, artistic talents of, of, our, of our lifetime. And um, this was owned by one of the greatest sort of singers and musical talents of our lifetime. So what could be better than the double whammy of, of artists uh, uh, for provenance of this picture? So, uh, um, and it's a similar color to the walls. You've got sort of the pink and the yeah, red, yeah. you know. And, um, and a blanket, where would you hang a blanket? The bedroom. There so, it is. Uh, there it is. So it's, uh, it really is to wake up and see that every morning really is something, uh, something special. Um, then over here, uh, staying on the theme of, uh, of Tracy Emin, so we've, we've seen a tapestry, a blanket, and uh, actually, as I mentioned earlier, in recent years, Tracy Emin's been doing mostly painting and sculpture, and uh, I absolutely love her paintings. So this is, um, I think, the most recent work in the house. It's 2019, wow. um, and it was in a show that she had with her gallery that represents her uh, uh, in Italy here, um, uh, Lorcan O'Neill in Rome. And um, it's, uh, as you can see, <laughs> yeah. 
a nude. And of course, uh, Tracy Emin is uh, connected a lot with Sheila in the way that she sort of uh, draws and uses the, uh, uses the line. So, uh, um, however, I personally see uh, a bit of Henry Moore in this, this uh, picture. Right. And um, of course, we know the Henry Moore sculptures, they're quite sort of rounded. You often have sort of this kind of sort mm -hmm. of pose. Mm -hmm. And uh, for some reason, maybe it's just me, I, I resonate uh, s sort of uh, with, with this picture with regard to Henry Moore. Right. So, uh, um, uh, and uh, you know, it's a very kind of soft, beautiful work and uh, great composition. And um, her paintings really are just just, just fantastic. So uh, she's doing a little bit of layering too, as we saw. Exactly, exactly. So uh, again, tremendous depth to the picture, as there always always is with uh, what we or often is with Tracy. Francesco, if you could actually get the whole um, bedroom, I don't know if you've managed so far, just so that our guests can have a look, and then we'll reach our last painting of the day, which yeah. is quite a statement, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, we're, we're finished on a, uh, another abstract artist that paints figurative abstract pictures. Um, this is a 2004 work by Cecily Brown. Mm. I, uh, of course, the British artist, moved to New York in the late 90s and has painted from there uh, ever since. <clears throat> this is a similar age to me, I think, within, within about a year or two. And um, her early works in particular, I just find absolutely blockbuster. We've talked extensively about, you know, the importance of composition, the importance of color, yeah. the importance of, of work in the painting, layering, and my goodness, do you, do you see it in this? Millions of colors. Uh, layer upon layer upon layer upon background of paints. I mean, how you get from this sort of red, which seems to be the furthest in the background here, yeah. to then these whites and yellows, and then all this mass is going on top of that. And then, you know, you have these beautiful flowers coming out, that's sort of the, um, the almost tangerine colored leaves. And um, it's really just, just the foliage at the bottom of the yes. picture. Yes. is astounding and if it wasn't on such a you know a palazzo sized wall you probably wouldn't even gravitate to that so much if the painting was you know was shown much lower but even in these areas here you really see the the absolute uh, genius of Cecily Brown's uh, painting which of course she's become you know so famous for um but in even addition the figures I mean even the figures are beautiful the yeah I know Exactly, and often there's more than two figures in, in one of her paintings, not always, but this one's called Couple, and um, sometimes there's a play on old masters in her pictures, of course, mm -hmm. and this one's clearly a, a play on Sir Francis Bacon, the, the, um, the way that the fences are painted, the colours, and the way that the colour merges, merges is clearly uh, highly Bacon-esque. So Christian, this painting is going to Florence. It's going to be exhibited here in Florence. The idea is, is to do an exhibition of the modern day collectors of Florence. Oh. So, um, so I'm loaning five works from my collection uh, to that, um, of which this is one. So this is coming off the bedroom okay. wall uh, in a few days time and going to the Renaissance Palace, the Medici Palace of, uh, of the Riccardi. And uh, so I'm loaning Cecily Brown, um, George Michael's Hurricane painting uh, by Tracy Yemin. Um, I'm also loaning uh, a large and important 1983 uh, Bridget Riley. Um, I'm also loaning an Elaine de Kooning uh, and from her cave painting series. And uh, I'm also loaning the Louise Bourgeois Nest of Five sculpture oh, okay. that we saw in the chocolate room. Christian, it's been a pleasure, as usual, to um, speak with you and to experience your wonderful collection. Uh, a long show, but then who can resist? <laughs> who can resist these well, beautiful works? Once we get works? into talking about these pictures, yeah. it just, uh, yeah. it's, it's hard to stop. It's, uh, yeah. There's really so much to say and so many layers. We've seen painterly layers, but they're also 
um, layers within society and relationships with these artists, you know, with each other and, and with their partners, etc. that has been such a pleasure to explore with you. And thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. Um, really, it's, it's just, it's an impressive collection and it's an, an impressive, um, how would we say, a, a sentiment that you share um, of your interest for these works, for these women artists in particular. And, um, well, thank you very much <laughs> uh, again for asking me to do it. So uh, it's yeah. a privilege and uh, I'm yeah, happy that other people are interested in, in seeing the work. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.